Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly Chaos at the Border. A report and reaction as the U.S. prepares for the end of Title 42. Front and center. Former President Donald Trump weighs in on the border and abortion in last night's fiery town hall. Cause for concern. A closer look at a free speech lawsuit regarding a pro-lifer in Mexico. And ready for a feast? What Pope Francis is saying about Coptic Orthodox workers killed in 2017. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight with the end of Title 42 just hours away. The surge of illegal migrants attempting to cross the southern border is breaking records. Today, Border Patrol agents made more than 10,000 apprehensions for the third day in a row. Republicans say the president can end this crisis right now, but refuses to do so. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest. You may recall earlier this week, President Biden unveiled a new rule that will penalize asylum seekers who cross the border illegally or fail to apply for protection in other nations on their way to the United States. But Republicans tell me it's too little, too late. This is a conscious decision by the Biden administration to take a tool out of the toolbox that's been very effective and it's going to lead to holy hell. Utah Senator Mike Lee tells me Department of Homeland Security just has to follow current laws to secure the border, but won't. If you show up, cross over a southern border by land seeking asylum and you're undocumented, you're uh, going to be detained until such time as that application can be processed and finally adjudicated. Republican Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina is one of the sponsors of a bill extending a policy similar to Title 42 for another two years. He tells me the recent killing of a Texas family, the suspect, a neighbor who had been deported several times, is possible to happen again. People with criminal records, people trying not to get detected by Border Patrol, trying to get into the United States and continue what in this case was clearly bad behavior, felony behavior, before he ever got here from Mexico. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffrey says all Republicans want to do is limit opportunities for immigrants coming to the U.S. Well, they want to waste billions and billions of taxpayer dollars on a medieval border wall, a 14th century solution that will not work to a 21st century challenge. The Republican-led House did pass the Secure the Border Act today, which would start rebuilding the wall along with other provisions, but it will likely never get brought to the Senate floor for a vote. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. A former President Donald Trump says that he is against the end of Title 42, adding that he thinks it will lead to 15 million migrants entering the country. At a CNN town hall last night, the former president also weighed in on the fight for the unborn. While he did not commit to signing a national abortion ban, he did call the overturning of Roe versus Wade, quote, a great victory and added that pro-lifers are now in a strong negotiating position. We go now to John Elliott, managing partner of Brighton Strategy Group and the former spokesman for the National Security Council. John, welcome back. Always great to be with you. Uh, I want to talk about last night's town hall with former President Trump, but first, your thoughts on the end of Title 42 tonight and what you think comes next. Well, look, I think President Biden uh, said it best when he said that this is going to be a chaotic period or it's essentially chaos is what they're doing and it's all on his watch. What you have right now, Tracy, just put it in perspective, you have under Trump, there were 50,000 migrations or, or uh, arrests of migrants coming over the border every month. Now what you have is with President Biden up to now, it's been four times that. It's been 200,000 or a little under 200,000. Last few months, it's been over 200,000 per month. Now with this new policy, the estimates on both sides of the aisle is that you're going to have twice what Biden has. So you're going to have 400,000 migrants coming over the border who are apprehended. And then that doesn't even count another, say, fifth of that who are gotaways. So you're talking really about half a million migrants coming across now. And so that's literally something like close to five million per year that we're going to have more than twice what it is right now. So President Biden's absolutely right that it's chaos. But one other thing, Tracy, is that as your previous segment alluded to is that you have a solution that is being put out there, which is to reinforce or to reinstate what 
Biden did on day one in terms of eliminating the Remain in Mexico policy that Trump had. And the second thing is to finally build the wall. And you had that clip with Hakeem Jeffries saying that building a wall is medieval and it's some really bad thing. Let's just review the bidding. President Obama voted for a wall. President Biden, when he was in the Senate, voted for a wall. Everybody, both sides of the of the aisle were for building a wall because, once again, in Israel, it stopped migration 100 percent from the West Bank, whereas now, or almost 100 percent. So that would really solve the border issue. And we were on the track under President Trump to actually get that done. And then now, suddenly, people are playing politics with it. And it's only because President Trump, when he came down the elevator back in 2015, he said one of his big priorities was to build the wall. And suddenly, everybody said, oh, wait a minute, uh, we can't do that. That's racist. That's bad, et cetera. But that's the only solution. And the Republicans have put that in their bill that they have and are going to pass today, hopefully. John, you know, I know that you know the southern border pretty well. I mean, you served down there with the Marines as part of uh, Joint Task Force 6. Uh, and as you know, President Biden is deploying about 1,500 troops to the border won't be doing the same thing as you did on your mission. Let's talk about that and what you think of that strategy by the Biden administration. Look, when I was a young Marine officer a while back, years ago, I was on the border with, as you say, Joint Task Force 6, which was a joint program that was put mainly to interdict or to report to the border patrols because Marines and active duty forces cannot actually interdict their posse comitatus laws against that. But what they did is they used the best trained people, which were or the best trained units, which in our case was a Marine reconnaissance unit. You have others that were from the Army and others uh, that are that are ta that are very good at that. And what it was is having them in a tactical mission with the latest thermal gear, the latest the latest vision goggles, et cetera, that they would be able to report to the Border Patrol in real time what's happening and then have the Border Patrol then apprehend them. So it was a way to really clamp down on any flow of either immigrants or, or or drugs across the border. And then now what you have is an explosion there. But what's happening, this 1500 deployment by President Biden is a complete Band-Aid and it's a joke. It really actually insults those active duty troops because guess what? They're not going to be doing what we did, which was actually actually report on, on in real time the migrants and the drugs flowing across the border. Instead, get this, they're going to be working in a warehouse, pushing paper, doing administrative clerical work. And that's really an insult to these highly trained active duty forces to have them essentially push paper instead of actually protecting the border with the Border Patrol. John, we have about a minute left. And I quickly uh, want to pivot to this. I want to talk about that town hall last night with President Trump. Uh, you were a senior advisor in his 2016 campaign. So I want to get your thoughts overall. What did you think about that and what stood out the most to you? Well, what stood out right away was that, look, he's very combative. And that's what a lot of us like, a lot of Americans like, because he's going to go just like he did in the first four years. He's going to go if he's reelected and once again shake up the establishment in Washington. And that's why people like that combative attitude. And look, you know, he can spar with the moderator and that's a lot of attention paid to that. But people really want to see a character who's a fighter and they want to see somebody who has a command of the issues the way that he did. And there's almost no one. Certainly, look, those of us who are uh, less than half his age on the campaign had trouble keeping up with this president or with, with Mr. Trump at the time. And so he brings an energy. Can you imagine Joe Biden doing that at a town hall right there? I mean, he would not even know what time zone he's in in terms of answering some of those questions. And there's a real energy gap there. And that's why a lot of Republicans are excited to have the former president go in with the experience that he has and once again, shake things up in Washington. And we're going to leave it right there, John. Always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Tracy. Well, the top human rights division of the United Nations is calling for an end to the violence in Sudan. The Human Rights Council has called this special session to express its urgent concern for the rights and lives of Sudan's people. A one-day emergency session addressed the killings, injuries, and other abuses against civilians since the conflict began last month. The council is set to vote on a resolution to condemn the two rival generals at the heart of the conflict. A newspaper in Hong Kong says it will no longer publish works by the city's most prominent political cartoonists. This, as the drawings drew complaints from the government. The Chinese language newspaper did not elaborate on its decision. The comics began back in the 1990s and were popular for their depiction of life in the former British territory. Many say this is another example of China silencing free speech, especially of those who are critical 
of the communist government. While well, the Supreme Court of Pakistan he is calling for the release of former Prime Minister Imran Khan. His arrest two days ago sparked countrywide protests. The high court says his arrest was illegal. He is expected to be released from custody tomorrow. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including new developments, a closer look at the recent violence in the Middle East. Plus, a former lawmaker in Mexico is in legal trouble after speaking out against the transgender movement. orders the closure of the Red Cross. It is the latest crackdown on religious orders, charities and civic groups by leader Daniel Ortega. Officials say the humanitarian organization was guilty of, quote, attacks on peace and stability. Nicaragua plans to open its own version of the Red Cross. A former lawmaker in Mexico was recently convicted of, quote, gender-based violence for writing social media posts that push back against the transgender movement. The case involves Rodrigo Ivan Cortez, a pro-life civil leader. He was convicted after referring to a transgender man as, quote, a man who self-ascribes as a woman. This, as lawmakers in Mexico also consider a measure that would refer to Christian teachings about sexuality as hate speech. We go now to Tomas Enriquez, Director of Advocacy in Latin America and the Caribbean for ADF International. Tomas, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we really appreciate it. First off, tell us more about this case. Uh, your client, Mr. Cortez, is facing charges for referring to a transgender man as a man who self-ascribes as a woman. Tell us more about that. Yeah, you got it exactly right. Uh, Rodrigo is today a citizen, and like any other citizen, he's concerned about what's happening in his country. Um, when he saw the bill that was presented in Congress by Sam Aluevano, he decided to go to Twitter and speak out about it. And in doing so, by just using words, he was ultimately convicted in the first instance by the Electoral Court of Mexico of having committed uh, gender-based political violence and sexual psychological and digital and symbolic violence merely for having said that Salma Luevano is a man who identifies as a woman. So where do things stand right now with this case? Uh, I understand that Mexico's Supreme Court is considering whether to weigh in on this case. Yes, in this case, it's called the Electoral Court of the Federal Judiciary. It's a constitutional court, and it is the highest court in Mexico for this sort of cases. They are, they are, and we're scheduled to issue a decision last week on the case. Uh, yet, for reasons that are currently unknown, they decided to punt on it and uh, simply took it out of the docket for a later date. So, Rodrigo Van Cortez is currently waiting to see whether or not his appeal will be. Um, not heard, but rather decided, and whether or not they'll quash the judgment by the first instance court. Tomas, tell us how significant this case is. I mean, can you put it into perspective for us? Yes. Um, so it has been the case that currently, uh, internationally, we've never seen any jurisdiction where uh, an individual has been convicted of having used you know, his own or her own speech to refer to the reality of a man being a man or a woman being a woman. Um, Mexico is the first place in the world in, the, in which this is happening, and this actually has happened already in the past. There is def definitely a movement, a phenomena of those in power using uh, the, the power of the state to chill speech and win the argument over reality, not by persuasion, but rather by simply using force to um, avoid opponents from speaking out. And that is exactly what they're trying to do with Rodrigo Van Cortez, and that is exactly what we're trying to stop from happening in the future uh, through legal action today. Yeah, and there seems to be a lot of concern among the faithful in Mexico regarding free speech. Uh, what more can you tell us about that? Well, as I said, this is part of an ongoing process uh, over there, and it has affected churches, it has affected individuals like Rodrigo, and even politicians. Nobody is really safe from uh, specifically this activist court, which in alliance with Salma Luevano, who is the one that has been bringing all of these cases to the court, is simply using it for the chilling of speech. Um, now, it, it happens that you don't really need to punish everybody. You just need some specific, very notable, high-profile cases like that of Rodrigo or of uh, lawmaker quality uh, uh, um, uh, to just be the way in which you show the rest of society that if they speak out and try to tow uh, or they don't tow the line, 
this is what's going to happen to them as well. Well, Tomas, we have probably maybe 20 seconds left or so, but anything else about this case uh, that you'd like our viewers to know about? It's a, it just uh, a showing of the sad, unfortunate state of affairs with respect to the judiciary in Mexico. Uh, as I said, this case has been pushed back, and it has been pushed back for very suspicious circumstances. There's not really much of a guarantee of having an impartial tribunal, and we think that that's very, uh, a very sad state of affairs. But we trust that ultimately justice will prevail. Well, Tomas, thank you so much for talking to us about this case. We really appreciate it. God bless you. God bless you, too. Thank you. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, ready for a feast? What Pope Francis says about 21 Orthodox workers killed in 2017. Plus, a centuries-old group seeks to raise awareness about the Holy Land. Tonight, as the fighting between Israel and Palestine continues, two Palestinians were killed today in retaliation after Palestine's rockets left parts of Gaza Strip in ruins. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that Israel dealt a harsh blow to the militants and warned that the fighting is not over. Joining us now to talk about this and more is Rabbi Yaakov Menken, Managing Director of the Coalition for Jewish Values. Rabbi Menken, always great to be with you. Uh, let's talk about what we see playing out here in the Gaza Strip right now. I mean, this has been some of the worst fighting that we've seen uh, recently between Israel and the Palestinian, Palestinian excuse me, militants. It's, it's very sad. It's, it's alarming. There have now been hundreds of missiles fired at Israel's civilian population centers. Uh, they are aiming at civilians. It's it's very clear what they're trying to do. You know, it's it's very interesting. Israel has this Iron Dome system to protect against missiles, and you hear anti-Israel voices saying, "Well, do we, don't we need an Iron Dome for Palestinians?" The answer to that is they actually have a better system. It's a hundred percent effective. All they have to do is stop trying to kill people. If they stop trying to fire missiles at Israel's population centers and stop trying to send terrorists into Israel to kill people, there is a 100 percent halt to Israel's defensive strikes in retaliation. It's unbelievable how that works, but they could stop the fighting immediately if Hamas didn't want to kill people. Yeah, and the U.S. ambassador to Israel tweeted out today uh, his concern about these continued rocket attacks and wrote in part, we stand by Israel's right to defend itself, working toward a quick de-escalation. Uh, Rabbi, how do you see this playing out? I mean, do you think a, a de-escalation will come anytime soon? Uh, you know, the problem is that there are entirely too many voices at work, and you see that even here in the United States and what just happened in the Capitol, that these are people who are going to keep the fighting go ongoing because they continue to blame Israel for defending itself instead of trying to stop the aggressors from committing acts of aggression. No, Jews are not occupying their ancestral homeland. They're living in it. And as soon as you find four voices willing to make peace, like the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, you immediately have the Israelis sitting down and making peace. That's all they need to do. So the de-escalation will happen when genocide is no longer their goal. You know, you mentioned what happened uh, in Washington today, so I, I kind of want to go there. Talk to us more about this event that uh, Senator Sanders, who is Jewish, held this uh, Nakba event. Yeah, well, he proves that a person can be a Jewish member of the Jewish people and still be an anti-Semite. It, it's true throughout history. Some of the worst damage has been done by Jews who turn against the Jewish people. This event was, was shameful from beginning to end, the entire thing being built on a lie. Uh, the Nakba, the catastrophe of the creation of the state of Israel, what do they have against increased lifespans for Arabs or higher education or the right to vote or the participation in every level of government? What they have is a hostility to Israel's existence. If you go back to 1948, the Israelis accepted the idea of partition from the United Nations, and the Arab League gathered explicitly for a momentous massacre. They were going to commit genocide against the Jews of Israel, like Hitler had so recently done in Europe. Their Nakba, their disaster, is they fell 99 percent short of the goal. When you're celebrating that and you're having a Nakba ceremony and you're talking about the, the attempted genocide against the Jews and redefining, by the way, the 
idea that a Palestinian is an Arab and not a Jew, that's racist mythology. Go look at the last 2,000 years. It's not the way history works. So this entire thing was shameful beginning to end, and we really thank Speaker McCarthy for excluding it from the Capitol building, and it is shameful that it was brought to the Dirksen building of all places. Senator Everett Dirksen was a great friend of Israel and the Jewish people. Yeah, the backstory of that is Rashida Tlaib was planning on doing that. And as you mentioned, Speaker McCarthy shut it down. And then here we see what happened today with Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, really shocking there. Rabbi, before I let you go, what else are you following? Well, actually, that's the big issue right now. We just sent a new letter to Senator Schumer as Senate Majority Leader calling upon him to condemn this event. We had actually originally, we reached out not only to Speaker McCarthy, but to Hakeem Jeffries and on the uh, Senate side, both to Senator McConnell and to Senator Schumer. Now, you know, it's, it's time. Now it's clearly in the Democrats' court to show that fighting anti-Semitism and backing Israel is a bipartisan issue the way it always used to be. And remember, I mean, I know your audience is mostly Catholic. It never stops with the Jews. So we're all in danger here when that type of rhetoric is allowed in the Capitol. Yeah, indeed. Rabbi Mankin, thank you so much for your insights. Always appreciate it. Thank you. Well, a centuries-old group associated with both the Vatican and the Holy Land held an event earlier today. It seeks to raise awareness of Jerusalem as a place of encounter. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tannhauser spoke with the head of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre and has this report. We're here in the headquarters of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, and with me is His Eminence Cardinal Filoni. You're hosting today a conference, a meeting on the Holy Land. It's called uh, The Holy Land, A Place of Encounter. Why is it important to speak about the Holy Land in these days? I think uh, uh, we have uh, to um, think about the Bible, the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible speaks about this land, not only Israel, not only Palestinian, but the Middle East. We think about Abraham coming from today, Iraq, Mesopotamia, people joining to him, arriving the Holy Lands, not only, but from Egypt. Sometimes people who used to come, the Hebrew came from the so this place became in many times a place of encounter for uh, the revelation of God. As the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, your responsibility is also maintaining churches, schools, buildings of the Catholic Church in the Holy Land, but also supporting the people living there. What's the situation of Christians today in the Holy Land? Well, this is the vocation which uh, Blessed Pius XI gave it to us as order. It means uh, people which would like to join in this order, representing in some way also the nations, and uh, supporting this mother church, which is the beginning of the whole church in the world. This is the place where the church was born. Now, we, as an order, we would like that this Mother Church is not just a place where you can go and you see uh, places, ruins, or memories, but still is a living church. But this, it is, uh, it is important to, to maintain alive this church. We as order, we want this place to be alive, not only for Catholics, but also for all those who are living there. And maybe very briefly, how can our viewers support your mission? Well, uh, we support this mission in some way with the participation and the contribution. The contribution of our knights and dames, which they, which they every year are uh, sending. We choosing projects which are presented to us by the Latin Patriarchate, we support all these elements. So this money, this uh, love, this uh, uh, pilgrimage, which we do, is a way 
of understanding, peace, supporting, and they give a life to uh, the communities there. Not only Catholics, not only Christians, but also Muslim and also Jews. Your Eminence, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, and uh, God bless you. Thank you. Uh, finally tonight, Pope Francis says that he will recognize 21 Coptic Orthodox workers killed by Islamic militants in 2017 as martyrs. They will also be given a feast day, likely in mid-February. The move is seen in part as outreach to the Orthodox. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.